change to come knowing the battles won for you have never failed me yet promise still stand great is your faithfulness faithful Still in your hands, this is my confidence. You never failed me yet. I know the night won't last. Your word will come. We'll sing your praise again. Jesus, you're still enough. Keep me within your love. My heart will sing your praise again. still stands great is your faithfulness faithfulness I'm still in your hands this is my confidence you never fail your promise still stands great is your faithfulness faithfulness still stands great is your faithfulness faithfulness still in your hands this is my confidence you never fail me promise still stands great is your faith
Good morning, everyone. Great to have you in God's house this morning. And uh, we just pray God's uh, spirit and energy into this place as we worship together. Uh, if you've been worshiping with us for a long time, maybe joining us just recently or following online, it's great to have you here today. We have another Bible study starting on Tuesday. It's going to be in the sanctuary, and you can join in person or by Zoom. It is another... Um, Amy Jill Levine book, and we're doing The Difficult Words of Jesus, 6.30 to 8 p.m. It's a six-week study. I know we talked about doing when bad things happen to good people, but we ended up doing the shack and talking a lot about those kinds of things within that. So we'll probably go back to doing when bad things happen to good people maybe in the spring. So I hope you join us for this on Tuesday, um, starting this Tuesday. Finally, next week, uh, we are on the schedule to feed down at Trinity for those of you unfamiliar with that ministry, you know, we, uh, we gather together with a whole bunch of churches around the county, and our, the, the, the place that we serve through is Trinity Episcopal Church. It's in the downtown area, and it, really, we take our turn uh, making sure that they have a hot meal. Uh, it's every Sunday, and ours is next week. And I, in addition, this year, we're, or this, this month, um, we're also leaving them with a sack lunch to be able to take on another day for that week. So there's a whole list of items on the signups right out in the, the narthex as you leave today. You don't have to go in person to be able to, to be a part of that ministry. Uh, if you do want to go, there's a sign-up sheet for that as well. If you could just bring one of the items that are on the list out there, that would be great as well. But that happens next week. Lord, we pray your presence into these special moments of worship together and let it not be limited to just this holy place. May that presence come into our cars as we drive home today. As we leave tomorrow, maybe for the places that we have to go and work, may that presence be in our homes, Lord, that we might draw upon it strength, as we want, uh, strive to make our family strong. May it make it to our workplaces, Lord. Because we know that uh, our work relationships are affected by us allowing your presence to be with us even at our places of employment. Lord, uh, we pray your presence into our lives and into our hearts and that which we call holy, which is our bodies. Because we know when that, where that presence occurs, life is just ordered differently. Our homes become a different kind of, uh, of, of place that is more than just a place to, to dwell. It becomes a place of safety and love and support. And we know that our work relationships become different when your presence is there. Maybe colleagues that we struggle to get along with, we have a bit of more of tolerance than we would before. We pray your presence in our relationships with our spouses and our kids and our grandparents and our parents. We pray your presence out on the highway when we're driving. Because when someone cuts us off, we start to react a bit differently. Instead of getting angry, we think that, well... That person obviously has some place very, very important to go to. And we pray your presence here in these moments. Because we bring the entirety of our lives into these holy places. These places of worship. All of our struggles, all of our celebrations, they all are brought into this sacred place. 
We are, feel so competitive at times, Lord. We want to know who will be the best and first. And we hope that it is each and every one of us. You call us special and we interpret to mean the best. And we feel that we are entitled to all that is due to those of us who are called the best. But your son Jesus reminded us that the best of us will be the servants, will be those who are willing to help and to witness to others, not for their own honor, but Lord, for yours, that you might have the praise. Far too long we have decided that we know what is best for our whole world, but we want that we want to run the whole show. But we, and we, we don't want to listen to you, O oh Lord. We want you want us to bring peace, to listen to others' needs and wants. We want to impose our wills on everyone. We have gotten way off the track of discipleship. And so bring us back, patient God. Bring us back into your presence. Shake the dust of arrogance from us and nourish us with humility and joy. And help us to be the kind of disciples that serve you faithfully. For we ask these things in Jesus' name as we pray together the prayer that he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hear these words from the 31st chapter of Jeremiah, verses 27 through 34, as found in the message translation. Be ready. The time's coming. God's decree. When I will plant people and animals in Israel and Judah, just as a farmer plants seed, and in the same way that earlier I relentlessly pulled up and tore down, took apart and demolished, so now I am sticking with them as they start over, building and planting. When that time comes, you won't hear the old proverb anymore. Parents ate the green apples and their children got the stomach ache. No, each person will pay for his own sin. You eat green apples, you're the one who gets sick. That's right. The time is coming when I will make a brand new covenant with Israel and Judah. It won't be a repeat of the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took their hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. They broke that covenant even though I did my part as their master. God's decree. This is the brand new covenant that I will make with Israel when the time comes. I will put my law within them, write it on their hearts, and be their God, and they will be my people. They will no longer go around setting up schools to teach each other about God. They'll know me firsthand, the dull and the bright, the smart and the slow. I'll wipe the slate clean for each of them. I'll forget they ever sinned, God's decree. There are many things in my life that I have experienced so many times that I hardly give them a second thought, but it didn't start out that way. My morning routine mixed in with Mike's morning routines. The way Ripley calls out goodnight to all of us, anyone in the house, and tells us that they love us, the way I can tell when Zoe the dog needs to go out, the way I can tell if Ripley has had a good day at school or not, the small ways we move easily around one another, even if each day is different. There are so many emotions and routines, facial expressions, ways of reading each other and tending to each other that have just become written into our lives. A lot of people claim that they worship God on their own time. 
They don't want to go to church because that isn't where they experience God. They go out into nature, a hike, sitting on a perfect hill, hill, hunting in the woods, canoeing down a river. And I agree that these are all magnificent places to experience God. The colors that the sun brings to the world around us, the light breeze, the majesty of the trees or the calm of the water gently moving us forward. God is written into nature in bold and obvious ways. It is easy to find or know peace and joy out there in nature. It seems easy connect to connect to the divine and know it in our lives. And I think it is important to take time in these places where God is written into everything around us so blatantly. Jesus often took time to pull away from the crowds and to be renewed. We all need a little obvious God in our lives to fill us anew. But what if that is where you stop? I hate to be the one to tell you, if that's the case, you're doing Christianity wrong. It is really rare that Jesus talks to us about Christian living as individuals. Yes, we are each supposed to have a relationship with God, but we are also supposed to constantly be working on our relationships within our families, with our friends, our communities, those other communities, people all around the world. It intrigues me that God creates us last in God's image, and yet looking into one another and our communities is often one of the most difficult places to see God or experience the divine. It should be the easiest and greatest place. Now, Mike has mentioned this before, but it is much easier to raise money for the needs and care of animals than it is for humans. A video of an abused dog makes us reach into our pockets, but for some reason, we have become hardened to the videos of starving children, trafficked children, abuse and violence around the globe, even genocide. Do we understand what genocide is? The deliberate killing of a large number of people from a particular nation or ethnic group with the aim of destroying that nation or group. It doesn't really phase us anymore. Order overwhelms us and we feel that we can't do anything about it, but we can save the puppies. Now, I am definitely not anti-puppy, and those commercials and stories bother me at my core, but I hate, or really dislike, how immune or indifferent I am to the evil in the world. I think it is because we have forgotten what it means to be created in the image of God. I think we have forgotten that all of God's children are divine. And that includes you, and it includes me, it includes your neighbor. Do you see the divine in me? Your neighbor? Yourself? What about that kid that bullies your kid? Do you see the divine in them? Ah, now we're on to something. In the scripture, God is talking about, yet again, creating a new covenant with God's people. And God keeps trying, that's for sure. See, back in the day, as God led God's people out of slavery and into the land of milk and honey, God helped the people of God define who they would be. God began to help them understand what it meant to be Israel, those who wrestle with God but love God what it meant to be a people that were in the image of God. Now, the Ten Commandments are often translated as, thou shalt not blah, 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 thou shalt not blah, blah, blah. But they should really be translated as, we are a people that. Instead of being a list of things not to do, it is a list that points out positive characteristics of what it means to live like God would like us to live. 
We are a people that don't steal. We are a people that don't lie. We are a people that honor our elders. We are a people that love one another, that love God. Many of us want to argue about each and every law actually laid out in the Bible, almost to see what we can get away with. But thinking that the Big Ten are the only guidelines God gives us is grossly misunderstanding the direction that God was trying to lead God's people. So God tried another way. We are a people that love one another, that love God. So what is love? It is patience and kindness. It is everything that is not rude. It is not envious and it does not keep score. It is not irritable. I need to work especially hard on this one. It doesn't rejoice in wrongdoing, but does rejoice with the truth. Love does not insist on its own way, probably because love recognizes the divine in one another. So much of the time we want a list of what we can't do, and we try to find all the loopholes we can. But God doesn't intend to give us a list of sins to avoid, but lead us in a way of living that brings about the kingdom of God. If you are about to make a choice, and it is arrogant or boastful, think twice. If you are about to do something out of your irritability, then think twice. If you are about to say something to someone that is rude, don't. God doesn't want to hold our hand and have to help us make each and every decision depending on whether or not we can prove it is against God's list of rules. God wants the Spirit of God to become an absolute part of who we are so that every decision we make is compared to the definition of love, the actions of love, and we begin to be able to know what is wrong and harmful and sinful without having to have a full list. See, God wants the will of God to be well understood, that it is just a part of who we are, the decisions we make, the life we live. God wants God's law to be written into our hearts, not as a hard, fast list of things we shouldn't do, but as an intrinsic knowledge of how to act out love instinctively. God wants the laws of God to be written into our every, our very lives, lived out in all we do, almost without thinking. People ask me questions like, is drinking alcohol a sin? And I always answer that it depends on who you are and how alcohol equates in your life. If alcohol makes you lie or cheat or steal, if alcohol interferes with your ability to love yourself or your family in the ways that you should, then it is a sin. There are so many things that we want to categorize completely as sin or not, when so many of these things have a whole spectrum of gray between the black and white. One of my greatest pet peeves is poor sportsmanship. I am all about teamwork and friendly competition, but in today's world, I see way too much encouragement by coaches and parents, those that should be teaching us to be loving, to do whatever is necessary to win against the other team. I just love when I go to a middle school soccer match and people cheer as one player takes another player out and not by a legal move. See, I have a bad knee because someone kicked it illegally in a Taekwondo tournament years ago, and it wasn't even a straight qual- state qualifier tournament. They got a warning, and I have a bad knee for the rest of my life. And these are our friends, our community that we are engaging with. What about the foreigner that doesn't speak like us or dress like us or smell like us or live like us? How easy is it for us to believe that we have it right and that they, we are really above reproach? And it sounds pretty arrogant to me, which is the absolute opposite of love. Imagine a world where God is our God and we are God's people and all the people around us knew that we were God's people because they experienced joy and calm and love when they are in our presence. That we 
that are created in God's image might renew the spirit of another in the same way that taking a moment in nature does. Imagine if living out the act of loving others didn't have to be something I thought about each time I made a decision, but it became first nature in my life because it was just a part of who I am. It is written on my heart. It is written into my life. All these things that are written into my life, our morning routines, our evening routines, it took time to adjust to them, to perfect them, to make them something we just live out. I wonder how long it will take me to just live out the love of God. I'm not sure, but I better start writing it into my life today. Amen. You know, every year about this time, uh, we start collecting uh, money for holiday meals. And uh, when I met with the mission committee a, uh, a little bit more than a week ago, we're going to go in a little bit different direction. We have a ministry down in the city called Isaiah 58. And we're, we've chosen to join together with about 20 other congregations and commit to providing 300 tangible holiday meals for families. And so how it all works is that each congregation just picks one item. It's not like we're going to be putting the whole entire package together. We're just going to be collecting one item. Uh, uh, the, the, we're going to have to wrap everything up right around the second week of November. So we have about five weeks to get this all done. But after much discussion, we decided that our one item was going to be Jiffy Corn Muffin Mix. And we need 300 of them. You know, now we chose it for a specific reason. You know, we wanted it to be a teaching tool, uh, even to the youngest among us. So this is, would be a perfect time if you, you know, you want to challenge your grandkids or your kids. If you're at the store, you can even find this at the convenience store. It's the little boxes. And they're about 64 cents. We found them online a piece. Uh, to be able to make a small sacrifice... You know, knowing that that's going to go to a family to make their holiday meal special. Now, you might not be a corn muffin person. There's other people providing like biscuits or rolls or maybe you're a roll person or a biscuit person. But I know every time that I go to Cracker Barrel, corn muffins are one of the choices. So at least 50% of families out there, that's what they're choosing for their holiday. 300 is what we need to collect uh, by the second week of November. So put that in the back of your mind when you're going to get some gas. Maybe you're someone who goes inside to pay. See if they got some corn muffin mix on there. Next time you go to the grocery store, challenge your kids, your grandkids. Maybe you want to, you know, do something in, in your neighbor's name or whatever. But the, we're going to collect them. They're going to all go in the, the blue bins that we normally collect items in uh, throughout the year. Uh, like you're going into the social hall or into the heritage room, excuse me. Um, and those, those are going to be housed. And uh, we have about five weeks to get that completed. 300, 300. And when you think about how you'd like to support the mission and ministry of St. Paul's, uh, there's always offering plates um, as you leave worship today. If you're an electronic giver, um, you can always go to our website, www.sp4u.org. And there's a giving tab right there on the homepage. Or you can mail something into 5508 Telegraph Road. Just one of, the, one of the many, many ways that we're seeking to make a difference in the community that God has placed us. Uh, as you think about how you like to support our ministry, may God's spirit be upon you.